We're pleased to welcome you to the AUSA Noon Report, our virtual series featuring senior Army leaders providing important updates on key defense topics. Our host today is AUSA's Vice President for NCO and Soldier Programs and the 15th Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. Glad you joined us today and welcome to the Association of United States Army's Noon Report. We're very glad you joined us and appreciate your continued support for our programs and events. I'm pleased to give a brief introduction of our special guest today and my good friend, Command Sergeant Major John F. Sampa, who is the Command Sergeant Major of the United States Army National Guard. He joined the United States Army in April of 1987 and has served in the Army National Guard and the United States Army for more than 30 years. He completed basic training as a tank armored crewman at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Sergeant Major Sample was promoted to the rank of Sergeant Major on 8 April 2009. Prior to becoming the Command Sergeant Major of the Army National Guard, Command Sergeant Major Sample served as a senior enlisted leader for the Texas Military Department from March 2017 to February 2018. Sergeant Major Sample was previously the Command Sergeant Major of the 36th Infantry Division for more than three years. Sergeant Major Sampa has mobilized for combat duty three times and deployed overseas for combat operations in Bosnia and Iraq. Sergeant Major Sampa's military and civilian education include all levels of the non-commissioned officer education system. He's a graduate of the United States Army Sergeant's Major Academy, and Sergeant Major Sampa is also a graduate of the Texas Highway Patrol Academy. For more details on his many accomplishments and decorations, you can access Command Sergeant Major Sampa's full bio in the handout tab on the upper right hand corner of your screen. If you have questions for Sergeant Major Sampa, please use the Q&A tab and post your questions in the box at the lower right hand side of your screen. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can. And we'll get the conversation started with a few questions that were sent in to us earlier. But before we do, I'd like to welcome you Sergeant Major Sampa and say thanks for joining us here today for the noon report. Thank you SMA uh, for allowing me to be here, you and General Ham and the rest of the AUSA team. Uh, allow me to come to this morning, uh, this afternoon rather, to uh, tell the guard story. As you know, we've had an unprecedented year in year 2020, and we're all excited about the accomplishment we've done in Army National Guard, and uh, look forward to the questions and and talking to the audience this morning. But before we get started, I'd like to give a shout out yeah. to uh, the Texas uh, chapter, uh, AUSA, led by uh, Major General Retired Bob Harrison. And, uh, I want to give a shout out to them because I'll be speaking with them uh, here shortly as well, too. Oh, General Halverson's a great man and a fellow tea patcher, from my understanding. Is that, that is correct? correct? Yeah. You mentioned me uh, deploying to Bosnia. When I deployed to Bosnia, General Halverson was the 49th Armored Division uh, commander. And I credit uh, General Halverson for a lot of my career success because that's when it really got started uh, in my career here, uh, becoming the Army Guard Command Sergeant Major. So thank you, uh, General Halverson, and the rest of the Texas team out there. Well, thanks for the shout out. And I know the Texas team appreciates that greatly. And as we do to have you here today, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major, before we get started the questions and before we go out to our audience, you know, I'd like to support our Sergeant Major of the Army, the 16th Sergeant Major of the Army's initiative. This is my squad. One thing he does is he has people tell their story um, so we can all get a better appreci appreciation for who they are. Um, could you share with our audience your story and why you decided to join the Army? Oh, I most definitely can. And thank you. Thank you for asking me for that because a lot of times, I'm the one going out asking soldiers about, you know, uh, tell me about yourself, how you grew up and this th kind of thing. And, and in that conversation, we do talk about, you know, how, what led me to be where I am today. But yes, I started, uh, I entered the Army National Guard in 1987. And when I graduated high school, uh, it was either go to the Army, or go to the college. And I was trying to decide which one I wanted to go to. And, uh, I decided to go to college, but while I was in college, I was going to in night class and a gentleman came in and he was in the Army National Guard. And it was probably about February time frame. And I think April, I was raising my right hand to join the Army National Guard and, and shortly moved out uh, to Fort Knox, Kentucky for my basic training. I went to basic training twice because uh, you had to split option. I had to go to school full time, had a full time job. So I did split op training. Went to basic training one summer and then came back and got a second dose for AIT back at Fort Knox. <laughs> but uh, uh, my time in the Guard has been been outstanding because it uh, being in the Army and Army National Guard, I've seen a lot of the, the changes that's come in my you know 33 years of service. And the things that the reason why I joined the Guard is because I just had that you know that 
something want me want to serve in the army. We always ask soldiers, as you always know, yeah. why do you serve? And really, they just can't really give you a definite answer why you serve. It just is something within them that wanted to serve. And that's why I joined the Guard, because it's something in me that wants to join the army and be part of the army itself. And so uh, I always tell, I always, when I go out to visit soldiers, I always look for the PFCs, because when I joined the army, I was a PFC. And I always tell that PFC is that I was in your shoes in your in your particular place at one point, and I didn't have no clue that I would become the Army Guard Command Sergeant Major. So if if I could do it, guess who else can do it? You as a PFC can do it as well too. So uh, I went from PFC, uh, hit every rank from that point, and here as the Command Sergeant Major, and not knowing that I would be here to do that, but it was. You know, did the took the hard assignments, made the sacrifices, and here we are today. And I'm proud to say that I'm the command sergeant major for the Army National Guard. Well, Sergeant Major, thanks for sharing that story. I think it's important that people know that and they hear it, especially our soldiers. That's and uh, and we're proud to have you as our Army National Guard sergeant major. And uh, we're blessed that uh, you made that decision many years ago to serve our country. Now, in your bio, though, I read that you're a graduate of the Texas Highway Patrol. You also had a very long history and another calling of service. Could you share a little bit about that as well? That's correct. So, you know, I, I'm from my family. My parents born and raised in Louisiana and during the holiday time, we always go back and forth to Louisiana and you always see the state troopers on the highway and it's always intrigued me. And so I was into engineering and I also wanted to be a state trooper and I got a chance to do both. But right now I'm currently a, a Texas state trooper I'm in the commercial vehicle enforcement uh, division there in the Houston area. Uh, I've been with the state troopers for over 26 years now, but I, I'm thankful for the Texas uh, Highway Patrol and the Texas Department of Public Safety because they allowed me to serve uh, in the Army National Guard in, in the capacity that I'm serving now. Because as you know, as a citizen soldier, we have the, the three pillars that we have to deal with. And, and the most important one is our civilian employers because they make a sacrifice as well too. And so uh, being a state trooper and, and along with being a, uh, a guardsman has really fulfilled uh, my calling as far as public service and giving back to my state and my nation. And I'm so proud to say that. Sorry, Major, you're right. It is important to highlight the fact that our guard soldiers serve twice. You know, they have an occupation many times um, in a civil service role, and they also serve our country um, in uniform. So thanks for your service in both of those uh, great organizations. So I know uh, our audience is waiting for us to get to some of the questions, Sergeant Major, and I'd like to start with a couple that were sent in earlier that I know is important to all of our listeners out there. And first one is, it's been an interesting year, to say the least. And I know many of us are looking forward to 2021 and ready to put 2020 in the rearview mirror. But we got to talk about the important impact that the United States Army National Guard has every year, but most importantly this year. Can, can you highlight some of the, the incredible things that the Army Guard has done in the year of 2020? Oh, most definitely. I mean, you know, we the, you know this has been an unprecedented year for the Army National Guard, and we call it, not, we call it the, the year of the Guard because, you know, we started out in early January, uh, late January, early February, with the COVID-19 and had soldiers of the Washington Guardsmen being called to state active duty, and then eventually, all states, 50, uh, 50 states, four territories had soldiers on duty for COVID response. And then shortly after that, we moved into the civil unrest uh, as a result of the George Floyd uh, uh, incident. And then sh shortly after that, we moved into hurricanes and wildfires and, and it, it just being an unprecedented year for our Army National Guard. In June, we had over 120,000 soldiers on duty serving somewhere around the world, whether it was uh, homeland response missions or our uh, overseas deployment missions for uh, uh, combat operations or uh, peacekeeping operations. We had soldiers, over 120,000 soldiers. 90,000 of those soldiers were either, were either doing COVID response or uh, civil unrest response. And so those are numbers that you just wouldn't think about as a guardsman. Yeah. In, in these days and time. And so that's why it's so, we are so proud of our guardsmen out there because of it being an unprecedented year for us to serve their respective state as well as uh, the United States of America. Well, Sergeant Major, I can tell you, I, I for one, and I know there's a lot of supporters out, that, out there of, of my position too, they have done a phenomenal job, a phenomenal job this year. 
um, bouncing and uh, all the different things going on. It's been an incredible year. I, I'll give you an example. So yeah. you have the 34th division out of uh, Minnesota. So Minnesota went from, those guardsmen went from covert response within five months now. They went from covert response to civil unrest to a CTC rotation at the National Training Center in uh, June, in the summer. That's a huge lift for those soldiers. And while that, and as you know, uh, it's made, to have a 90%, over a 90%, I think about 95% operation rating at the NTC Training Center, that's a huge success. Huge success. And so for those soldiers to, to do all that within five months, that's where the power of the guard is. Uh, our assistant soldiers, you know, can adapt to the environment, respond to the community, as well respond to the, the call of the nation. And that's what makes us so powerful and, and so proud uh, to be uh, the citizen soldiers in the Army National Guard. Yeah, unprecedented times, but unprecedented response, like you just described, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major, um, early on during the pandemic, we all know that Department of Defense had to make the decision for a stop movement order. And this had a profound effect on our active force, but equally on our guard, and, and maybe some cases even more profound. Um, you know, it stopped them the ability to go to professional military education and weekend drills, the, the time the guard uses, the critical time they use right. to build their readiness, That's right. um, but also has an effect on their civilian occupations. Can you, can you talk about some of the things the National Guard did to help ease the burden on our guard soldiers and their families? Most definitely, yeah. So, you know, as you just described, this, the stop movement affected the entire Department of Defense. And so they had a, a, a big effect on, on the guard because, uh, as you mentioned about our monthly training assemblies, where we come together and, and train and build our readiness. But most important, uh, the soldiers uh, gain their military credit during that time period as well, too. And so a lot of the soldiers depend on that training assembly, not only mm -hmm. for the military credit, but you know their compensation and the, uh, the insurance and all that. And so this whole COVID environment has put all of us into a virtual reality. And so we, the, as the leaders, we went back and revised how we trained because statutory wise, soldiers could not stay at home and get, tr get paid for training. And so what we did was we did some things that they could uh, be accounted for uh, virtual training wise, uh, doing courses online or uh, having, you know, some doing their DLC or something to that effect that they can annotate that training that they did online so they wouldn't be so the soldier and the family would not be jeopardized by them not going to drill that weekend because those those re weekend drills are, are so important because by statute those soldiers have to have a certain amount of drill weekends or a certain amount of training assemblies in order to have a good year for if they plan on retiring or mm -hmm. meeting their service obligation and so taking away those those military taking away that training affects that. It also affected, as you said, about the professional military education. We had soldiers that were scheduled to go to school mm -hmm. and could not because school was canceled or uh, because of the no movement order. Well, that has a, a second, third effect because of their civilian employers or uh, college or whether they might have been attending college or something like that. So now they have to reprioritize all that because they couldn't go. But what we've what we done in the Army National Guard is that we put a policy together that if a soldier were scheduled to go to school and could not because of the COVID-19 no movement order, the day the soldier was, put, was supposed to report to school, the soldier was promoted effective that day. And the soldier had a certain amount of time to get the education because it's still you know, soldiers still need to be educated in that in that sense. But w the soldier had a certain amount of time to complete his or her training. But we didn't want to jeopardize a soldier and the family by not promoting the soldier because they made the coordination with their employers, their families to be away and to no fault of the soldier. He or she could not go to school. And so, uh, you know, we promote soldiers on a vacancy. So we actually use a step program in the Army National Guard because we select the soldier to fill that vacancy, then we send them off to school and the soldier have, you know, the BOC is 12 months, uh, ALC, SLC, MLC is 24 months to get that schooling. And so when the no movement order was lifted, that's when the clock started. 
And so, but because of COVID still around, you know, there's still going to be some exceptions. It's going to be still some exceptions yeah, to yeah. that that piece because yeah. uh, of still school cancellations yeah. and stuff like that. And but, if soldiers have questions about that, obviously a chain of command, just call the chain of command. They're the best one to answer that question. Yeah, and they can, of course, use yeah. it, use your your uh, your NCO support channel uh, to do that because uh, they have all the answers, and your SAR majors and uh, command SAR majors should have all those answers. Well, again, very unprecedented times, but the, the the force, the entire force, all three components has done a phenomenal job as I watched them shift and and, cr and come up with creative solutions to some of the hard challenges that, that were faced by all the different things going on. So, That's correct, yeah. So, Sergeant Major, I, I want to get into one more question. I know our uh, audience out there has been already posting questions too, but I have one more important one. Um, and just as a reminder, if you have a question for Sergeant Major Sampa, please go to your Q&A tab and write down that question. And we'll get to as many of them as we can. And those that we don't, I promise you, Sergeant Major Sample will get a list of them. We'll make sure he reads every single one of those. So, Sergeant Major Sample, we had uh, Major General Vereen in for a noon report not too long ago. Um, he's the new USREC commander. He gave us an update on the active component and the Army Reserve's um, yearly um, recruiting efforts and how it was going. And it was very important for our audience to hear that. Can you share us uh, how retention and recruiting has been going for the Army National Guard? Well, I'm, I'm proud to say that uh, during this whole COVID environment that the Army National Guard did very well. We, we had an in-strength number of 335,000 and we made that in-strength number, 336,000, we made that in-strength number of 336. Mm -hmm. I, create, I, I credit all of that to the leadership and to the soldiers of the Army National Guard. I wanna thank you for, if you re-enlisted or extended your time in service in the Army National Guard, thank you for that because without you, we cannot meet our mission. And so we met our instrument, and I also credit the recruiters uh, and those liaison sar uh, sergeants we have down at the uh, basic training battalions uh, at the training sites, mm -hmm. because 97% of the, uh, the new recruits that we send to basic training came back as a full-fledged trained soldier into our units. And so we're very proud of that number that we can send that many folks to basic training and be returned back uh, and, and be returned back to the units uh, Full trained. fully Full trained. trained. Yeah, because, you know, we have one shot to get the soldier through basic training AIT because, again, that third pillar is the employer, their civilian life. And so anything that can disrupt that civilian aspect of them, we, we're jeopardizing the soldier being part of our unit. And so yeah. that's why that's why I'm very proud that we sent, you know, 97 percent of the folks we send came back trained because we got one shot to send that soldier through. And we want to maintain and keep everybody that we put into uh, the formation of put into basic training. We want to make sure they return and be part of our final organization of the Army National Guard. Well, thanks, Sergeant Major. Uh, Sergeant Major, let's go out to our audience. We're getting a lot of questions coming in. Uh, the first one is from Mark. Uh, and what he says is, what is the plan for COVID-19 vaccinations for our soldiers? Which is a great question. So right now, uh, you know, we're still following the CDC uh, guidelines until a, a, the Army, the Department of Defense put out an actual plan for vaccinations. Uh, we'll follow that plan. But right now, we don't know what that plan is in a sense until uh, something certified comes out from the Department of Defense. Uh, but I can tell you one thing, though, go out and get your flu shot, because that is uh, uh, a mandatory for every guardsman, every soldier in formation. So go out and get your flu shot. That is important because it contributes to the health of this nation. That's it's correct. important. And I got mine, Sergeant Major. So I am uh, good to go. I, and I got mine, too. I actually have a video <laughs> to challenge everybody to go out and get theirs as well, too. Yeah. But that, yeah, but but I'm glad you asked that question. But again, as you just alluded to, uh, SMA, is that, you know, getting your flu shot will reduce that risk of people getting sick That's right. and, uh, and possibly not uh, getting COVID as well too. So it's good. So I made our next question is from Frank and he says, would you please address the possibility of an extension of the title 32 duty for COVID response and, and other missions past December 31st? Well, so again, uh, that's, you know, it's been ongoing, uh, you know, right now soldiers on the title 10, 502 F, a lot of soldiers really on might not know what that really means, but you're on a, a, a federal Title 10 order. And the leadership of the Army National Guard and the National Guard is in constant uh, uh, communication with the DOD leaders to extend those orders. 
And so as, as long as right now, as long as the COVID-19 still upon us, there is still consideration to continue to extend those orders. So right now, uh, there's still no definite uh, answer or how long those orders are going to be extended. It's uh, case by case, state by state. But again, as long as COVID-19 is around, uh, I think those orders will continue to be processed. Excellent, Sean. Sure. So our next question is from James B. And first he says, Command Sergeant Major Sampa, good afternoon. And so, good afternoon. <laughs> what are your thoughts on leader development of our junior NCOs, Sergeant, Staff Sergeant specifically, Sergeant Major? Well, lead development is a key. And I ask uh, that you find your mentor, whether it's an officer or an enlisted person, because me, myself, and I'm sure SMA Daily would tell you the same thing, that uh, we didn't get here by ourselves. And so we had to have mentors to, to, to lead us in the right direction, help with that development of, uh, of our leadership skills and knowledge, as well as the, the primary military education uh, to get where, where we are. And so that's what we are, are struggling with right now in the NCO Corps is getting NCOs to be that subject matter expert as uh, we, we had back in the day. And so lead development is key because especially in NCO Corps, because we are the technical experts. We are the trainers of the Army and the Army National Guard. And so whatever uh, lead development course or exercise that you can be part of and take advantage of, I encourage you to do that uh, because it only can help you in your leadership as well as your career uh, experience in the Army National Guard and the entire Army. Because one day you could be sitting where I am at today being the Army Guard Command Sergeant Major. And I didn't know that, but because I had the right skill sets, the right experience through lead development, it put me here. So I encourage each and every one of you to get your lead development because it is key. Yeah. And that actually made me uh, remind me, Sergeant Major, that uh, if you want to hear more about Sergeant Major Sampa's leadership philosophy and a whole bunch of other great topics that are pertinent to the Army National Guard, you can go back and listen to our podcast that we did in April um, where Star Major Sanford answered a lot of those questions. And those podcasts are available on our website at AUSA.org. Star Major Sampa, um, Dan says, thanks for taking part in this forum. And thank you, Dan, for thanking Star Major Sampa. Another Dan. Yeah. <laughs> and can you describe what, you, and that's not this Dan, so this is a separate Dan. And can you describe what you feel might be future challenges for Guard NCOs in a multi-domain operation setting? So again, the, the, I feel the future challenges is again, the, the tempo of the guard. As we just talked about, we just had an unprecedented uh, a year of, of a high, very high tempo of the guard. And we wasn't in a, in a combat environment in a sense. This is homeland response. And so time is always the, the key for our army guardsmen. Uh, the amount of training that's required, um, to, to hone in your skills as well as your professional development. And so in, in a multi-domain environment, I, think, I don't think there isn't really a big challenge because the Army Guard has always met the call of our nation, regardless of what that is. But what we're doing in Army National Guard is we are now setting for the uh, training, division alignment for training, where we have eight division headquarters in Army National Guard right now. And we're aligning the 27 brigades directly to one of the eight training, uh, one of the eight uh, division uh, headquarters. And so with that, uh, we can actually have eight full-fledged uh, divisions if the nation call upon us, but also allow soldiers to serve at higher echelons uh, that they might not have had a, had a chance to serve uh, if they wasn't aligned to a certain division. And so it goes back to the lead development piece this give opportunity for our, our NCOs as well as officers to, to uh, serve at, at higher uh, echelons for that lead development, as well as to uh, get the experience uh, uh, that you might not have had before. So in a multi-domain operation, that will sur surely, surely help the Army National Guard meet those, those challenges that the nation may call upon us to do. But again, uh, get with your command sergeant major of your particular state, and they can talk to you more about the division alignment for training and how that will affect you in, in your respective state or your, your brigade or battalion as well. 
So I made our next question I knew was going to come up, and it comes up in all of our forums I, with uh, yourself and the S and the SMA as well, and it has to do with the ACFT. I figured that's what it was. And yes. uh, so Richard B. asks, Sergeant Major, how is the Army National Guard addressing the challenges of equipping units with the needed equipment to conduct the new Army combat fitness test? And for me, and I, I guess also for our listening audience, can you give us an update on where we are with the ACFT? I sure can. So right now... Uh, all the states uh, have the appropriate equipment that they need uh, for their state to conduct the Army Combat Fitness Test. I'm proud to say that Kentucky was the first state to receive the equipment in the entire Army. They set the standard how the, uh, the equipment was distributed uh, throughout the whole entire Army. Now, as far as the Army Combat Fitness Test itself, I've I had at, been asked questions about, you know, uh, are we soldiers going to be uh, given a discount at gyms or, or uh, fitness centers and stuff like that? Well, right now, no. And I always put it this way. I've taken the Army Combat Fitness Test many times. Even with the Army uh, APFT, I've never went to a gym or did anything like that. Even with the Army Combat Fitness Test, I still haven't went to the gym. I just train differently. Train. And so if you look into the manual talking about the Army Combat Fitness Test, there's exercises that you can do to help prepare you for the Army Combat Fitness Test. That's what I've done. And I just changed the way, you know, changed the way I, I train. So instead of running last, I run first. And I go get, I, I get my body fatigue uh, from running. And then I go through the motions of the sprint drag carry, stretching my muscles and, and doing the push-ups to compensate for the weight and all that. But the Army Combat Fitness Test is just one aspect of where we're trying to get to with the holistic health and fitness of the soldier. And so I always talk about, you know, when you ask soldiers about modernization, they always, first thing I want to talk about, uh, say is equipment and facilities. Mm -hmm. Well, they missed a key factor that the Army is also modernizing the soldier with the holistic health and fitness and the Army Combat Fitness Test, because now there's gonna be a certain level of fitness that's required of use of the soldiers in the future through the Army Combat Fitness Test. And so for me, my message to you as you know, soldiers of today and tomorrow is that you have to start taking care of your body you know, real early and throughout your years uh, of service in the Army, Army National Guard. And that's gonna help you later in life to have a better quality of life uh, when you become uh, older in your years. And it cut down the risk of you, you know, uh, obtaining all type of uh, different diseases or ailments that may mm -hmm. come about. Some, you know, we understand some of that's hereditary, you can't get rid of it, but again, it's still gonna give you a better quality of life if you take care of your body through the holistic health and fitness piece. So Army Combat Fitness Test is one thing, but taking care of your body is the main thing in order to do that. Now, each state has been issued all the equipment and your state leadership may have issued the equipment throughout your state or they may have not because of the whole COVID environment deal. And so as of now, you know, your, uh, your last record uh, uh, physical fitness test is the APFT. Uh, even though the, uh, the Army Combat Fitness Test is the program of record as we speak today, started October 1st of this year. And so, but if you are flagged, uh, if you flag for fitness, well then you should be given a, a APFT to remove the flag and then be ready for when the Army Combat Fitness Test come around. But prepare yourself. It's no different than training as before. You must train. Mm -hmm. I must train. I mean, I'm 57 years old, almost, uh, uh, I'll be 57 years old next month. And I could still uh, score a high four, 450 something on the test just by doing the test. But I know I have to go out and work and get my body uh, in physical fitness uh, shape itself uh, because your battle buddy requires you to do that. Because if something happened to you, you your, your battle buddy re relies on you to pull them to safety. And that's what I always tell folks, you know, I'm sure you got those questions as well too. When you was SMA is that, yeah, I'm a 42 alpha. Why I need to be in the same that's shape right. of 11 Bravo? Yeah. Well, when you're on a, on a mission and, and you're stranded, your convoy, get something, 
everybody needs to be in some type of physical fitness to take care of your battle buddy. And like you said, Sergeant Major, it's more than just that. It's holistic health. That's it's right. about keeping you healthy as a soldier, right? That's and correct. Ha and having you be on the team longer, right? So be on the team long. Because I'm glad you said that because I'll, I'll ask soldiers, how long you want to serve? How long you want to serve? And they say, well, I want to serve 20 years. I want to serve 25 years or 10 years. Well, who has a vote? And everybody always say, you know, your, my spouse, you know, my job, whatever. Well, no, your body has a vote. That's right. Because uh, if your body can say, well, you want to serve 25 years, but I can only do 20. And understand it because you may have gotten hurt in training or uh, in some kind of environment, combat environment or doing your service. But also there are so many uh, things that happen to soldiers off duty that they get hurt that it can affect your service. So when you're off duty, take care of yourself because it can have a, a direct effect on, on how long you actually serve in uniform because Absolutely. of the physical fitness piece. Good advice, Sergeant Major, too. So I have to dispel all the myths because you see them all the time. ACFT, there's a lot of angst out there. You know, Sergeant Major, he talks about it every time he's in with us and he's going to be in with us in January. And I'm sure Sergeant Major Lombardo will talk about it next week during his new report, too. But yes. so you, can you help me dispel? It's, it's here to stay, right, Sergeant Major? It's AC here to stay, okay. yes. You know, it, again. When you speak of modernization, it's not just modernizing equipment and facilities, it's modernizing the today's soldier and soldiers of the future. And so uh, go out, learn more about it, take it. And what's the thing about it though, so, uh, SMA, is that, mm -hmm. that many times I've taken the test, soldiers love the test. <laughs> You they just, love the you test. Just got, I say, you just got to take it. You just got to take it. Half of the angst is just taking the test. That's right. And, just taking the and test. I always say, it's like, you know, <laughs> I played football in, in, in my mm -hmm. high school days. And I always say, you know, you, you go to football practice every day, you get beat up every day, and you come right back for the same stuff again. That's right. And so we're warriors. Right. And so the Army Combat Fitness Test is not as hard as you, if you think it is if you haven't taken it. So go out. I encourage you to take it because it's not as bad and you're going to love it. That's right. Um, Sergeant Major, thanks for that. Great message, too. And Sergeant Major, our next question is from, I think, a good friend of both of ours, retired Sergeant Major Edison Rebuck. And oh. uh, he says, first of all, Sergeant Major Sampa, thank you for, for both of us doing this today. And But he wants to know, as a recent retiree, or even as a retiree in general, where can we help to push the Army Guard's message? How, how, do, how can we do that? So what you can do, uh, Sergeant Major, and again, happy late Thanksgiving. Uh, miss you on the team and I hope you're having a great, great retirement out there. Sorry, Major. But uh, so each state has a, an association. And so uh, you can push the guards message through those associations. The, each, each city community has uh, some kind of uh, uh, nonprofit organization. You can push the message through them. We push the message a lot through our ESGR uh, uh, program. And so there's many, many ways the, the Army Guard message can get pushed through. So I, I thank you for the question, Sergeant Major, uh, retire, because that's my, you know, encouragement to all Army Guard soldiers and all soldiers. Tell your story to whoever you are talking to. If you're just in a general conversation, tell your story, because a lot of times many folks don't know the sacrifice you're making uh, 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 by serving in the, in the Army National Guard or even in the Army. I, I still remember being out of NTC. You know, it's four o'clock in the morning in the middle of the desert out there and a big old moon pops up. And, and I think about, you know, there's so many folks sleeping right now and not really seeing the beauty of nature or not realizing the amount of soldiers on duty to protect at their freedom at any yeah. given time. Doing so yes. many different missions, too, especially That's correct. when you're talking the guard, Sergeant Major. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sergeant Major. And Sergeant Major Rebuck, thank you for the question. On to our next question, Sergeant Major from Philip. He says recruitment and retention questions. So this is good. How does the Army National Guard look at soldiers who left active duty on a RE-4 reenlistment code? And is there a possibility to serve in the Army National Guard or is a waiver request available for that code? So the only advice I can tell you about that is that, you know, everybody's different. And so go to your nearest uh, Army National Guard recruiting station, uh, go through the medical process, and if the medical process allow you to serve based on uh, whatever medical situation you may find, that's fine too. Uh, there could be a waiver process depending on what your, your medical condition is. Mm -hmm. But all I can tell you is that uh, we, we're more than uh, happy to have you in the Army National Guard. So I encourage you to go to your, to your local Army National Guard recruiting office immediately and get the process started so you can join the team and we can address that issue. So with, with me not knowing your full medical situation and how they evaluate that, 
all I can tell you is just go to the recruiting office and get evaluated. But we take we take uh, prior service folks all the time. And, you know, uh, you can be 35 years old. We'll still take you uh, in the prior service. Uh, so, again, uh, go to your local recruiting office. You still have the, the, the courage to want to serve your community because we're in, you know, over 2400 communities in, in the entire uh, Army National Guard. And we have we have a Marine to Guard program right now where you know, there's thousands of Marines that 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 Get out of service. Yeah, they can come join. The guard. Let's come join the guard. Yes, because, right. you know, they're not all type uh, uh, Marine reserve mm -hmm. centers all over the place, but the guard is everywhere. Oh, is there a lot of Marines taking advantage? There's of a lot of Marines yeah. taking advantage of that. Yes, that's good. To hear. Because, you know, our our uh, uh, MOS is pretty much line up with the Marine MOS. Uh -huh. And so they want uh, they can come serve in the Army National Guard and continue to serve the community. And there's an incredible amount of places they can do it in the Army National Guard. That's correct. That's what I say. Yeah. We're in, you know, over yeah. 2,400 communities. So. My assumption is, too, is that the nice new uniform you're wearing is probably a big attractor of those Marine soldiers. Well, I mean, it's, it's not an attractor. <laughs> I've had some prior service folks that say, I want to get back just to wear the uh, uniform itself. So, uh, yeah, but it's, it's a great uniform. It's a great recognition to the Army. And, uh, and a lot of folks uh, go, you know, take it all the way back to World War II because they have memories of their grandparents or their parents uh, wearing this uniform and it's great, great lineage. And I, I think that's important, Sergeant Ranger. So, um, you know, we did that because we wanted to reconnect with the American public, go back to a time where um, the soldier was, an, uh, you know, just a national figure. And, and is that working? Do you see that right now? Sergeant constantly, yeah. constantly being stopped by uh, folks that, that have served, have never served, but still uh, know what this uniform bring and what they have done in the past. To, to recognize the army, so it's it was a great move by the army. In my in my personal opinion, I think it was a great move by the army, and I'm proud to wear it, uh, maintaining my my belt line, my, my waistline here. <laughs> yeah. I got to do them leg tucks. Well, thank you for yeah. sharing that yeah. with us, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major uh, Dan asked, the army is focused on modernization, but many legacy programs critical to defense support to civil authorities are being either cut or terminated. How will the National Guard maintain these capabilities as Army acquisition shifts funds to modernization? Well, so again, uh, as I spoke earlier, that the, the Army Guard, we are able to do our homeland response mission by, you know, our training that we that we receive and education we receive for our wartime mission. And so, re regardless of you know how the modernization take place the soldier's still going to get that required training of, of being a soldier. The discipline that comes behind that, the leadership that comes behind that, and they're always going to be vehicles as well, too. So uh, as long as we have those three ingredients, uh, the Army National Guard can continue to do its mission to uh, protect and serve their communities uh, as we move out throughout the years. Thanks, Sean Major. So, Major, I know, uh, well, and it came up again, ACFT, because this is an important subject, though, for Understood. our soldiers. And he says, good afternoon, SMA and Sergeant Major. With soldiers training, um, this is from Shane, for the new standards on the ACFT, will the Guard be held responsible for any injuries, uh, line of duties attained while training on uh, or off orders? Off duty, he's talking about, yeah. yes. So, again, there, there is a required, I mean, there's a requirement of, of uh, soldiers in the Army National Guard to maintain their physical fitness because it's Army policy. My recommendation to you is that if you uh, got hurt while trying to maintain that physical fitness off duty, go to your, your doctor, get an assessment, and bring that information to uh, your uh, unit so you can get medically evaluated by a Army uh, doctor or, or physician. And then they can make the determination on if the injury was was tied to a related uh, uh, training that you was trying to do to maintain the Army standard. And so we'll go from there. Uh, uh, but again, if you have been injured training off duty, physical fitness wise, go to the doctor immediately, your civilian doctor, get the information and bring that information to your uh, unit to get uh, looked at through the uh, medical the Army medical physicians, and we can make that determination at that point. Thanks very much. So I made a question from Jared. He says, with the cancellations of CTCs and ex-CTCs um, within the past year regarding Army National Guard brigades, how has the, that affected the deployability of National Guard units? So uh, 
you know, we, there are some CTC rotations uh, uh, canceled. And then so we're going to make up those, try to make up those this year. But it has not uh, uh, stopped uh, our deployment process. Those, those units that are, are, are scheduled for deployment are meeting all the training requirements they, they need to, to meet. So it has not changed any of that. So we're still uh, deploying and, and redeploying soldiers on a continuing basis. I don't know if you know this or not, but you know we have Army National Guard soldiers uh, in every combatant command around the world. Right now, there's over 57,000 soldiers on duty uh, somewhere in the world uh, for our wartime mission. But you, we have name operations uh, that we are assigned to as Army National Guard. Uh, we're in uh, the division headquarters has their uh, operation there in uh, Kuwait. We're in uh, Djibouti, Africa, peacekeeping. We're in uh, Sinai, mm -hmm. peacekeeping. We, we're in Poland, uh, peacekeeping, uh, everywhere. And then recently, uh, on the southwest border, we have uh, now uh, have units on the southwest border on Tyler 10 uh, serving on the southwest border mission. So uh, along with missile defense, as well as air defense here in the National Capital Region. And so there is a constant amount of soldiers uh, being uh, activated for mobilization uh, to serve our nations around the world. And so, again, uh, uh, the, the cancellation of the CTC rotation has not affected our ability to deploy uh, uh, for, our, for our calling of, of the nation. Well, that's good to hear, Sergeant Major. Sergeant Major, a question from Ed. He says, would you offer your understanding of strengthening the spirit of the soldier? Will I do what then? Offer your understanding of strengthening the spirit, spirit of, the, of soldier. the soldier. So, yes. The, stri the, the strengthening my spirit is just looking at the phenomenal work that the Army National Guard has done over the course of 2020. And here uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to celebrate the Army National Guard birthday on December 13th. 384 years of service to our nation and our respective states. Uh, the oldest service of, of the military and the second largest uh, service in the DOD uh, 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 inventory. Is the, is the National Guard. And so, you know, looking at the sacrifices that the soldiers make every day and their family make every day to serve their respective state and their nation gives me the spirit to continue to serve and make the sacrifices well too. We started out December 13th, 1636, where the militia dropped, as we say, the, you know, the symbol of the, the Minuteman is the plow. We still have soldiers today, you know, 336,000 soldiers a day, you know, putting their plow aside, meaning their civilian plow aside, and taking up their arms to serve their nation and serve their state. And so that's, that, that's the spirit within every guardsman and reason why we serve. And I hope you can see that spirit and, and get hold of it because it's something that, that, uh, that it's unexplainable. It's just the achievement to know that the guard is there for our nation, uh, whether it's a state homeland response or even the call of a nation. I, I go back to a story. Uh, there was a hurricane in Florida and uh, uh, so people were trapped and it was a news reporter there. And he said that, you know, the folks are trapped and the guard is showing up with the trucks and the equipment and the, the, the people that are trapped have a sense of relief now because the guard showed up and they that's the trust we have with our communities. And that's the trust we're trying to maintain with our communities. That if something happens, your National Guard, your Army National Guard would be there to help you. Well, I can tell you, Sergeant Major, I feel that same appreciation and trust when I look out my window and see a guard soldier in my state, or if I'm driving down the road and see them doing their job and the many things that they do from domestic response to storm damage to fires and all those other things. So, That's correct. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for your incredible service. So I made one last question. Uh, I think we have time for, and then we'll have to wrap it up. And it's from a fellow Texan, okay. um, Major General Retired Rodriguez. Okay. Um, he says, does there continue to be an appetite among state partnership countries for NCO development? And where are Guard NCOs support their development through exercises and training exchanges? And uh, he also says, Sergeant Major, thank you for your stellar leadership. Hmm. Well, good afternoon, sir. And uh, yes, 
uh, we have 80 state partnerships around the world now. And we just recently, as Texas just recently brought on Egypt as a state partner. And uh, of course, with the COVID environment, a lot of that state partnership uh, uh, training or, or has stopped, but, uh, but the relationships and the communications is still ongoing, even though we've, we've curtailed some of the things that we used to do in the past. But yes, the state partnership is a huge, huge uh, uh, deal for not only the Army National Guard, but for the entire Army itself, because it's still building relationships with those countries and those countries trusting us as a ally that we'll be there for them and their protection of their nation and, and, and people as well too. So again, I'm proud to say that yes, the state partnership is still in full of fledged. And again, Texas just brought on an additional state partner, uh, Egypt. Texas has actually have three, uh, Egypt, Chile, and the Czech Republic. And for our best, for the Texas Best Warrior Competition, we invite those state partners uh, to bring their soldiers and they participate uh, in the, the best warrior competitions for Texas. And a lot of other states mm -hmm. have uh, started that, doing that as well, inviting soldiers from their state partners to come participate in our best warrior competitions. It's an incredible program, Sean Major. And I'm sure Texas has to. They're a big state. They're a big Every, state. Everything's big in Texas. Everything's big in Texas. <laughs> Well, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we had today. And thank you, Sergeant Major, for being here with us and sharing, one, your incredible story, but more importantly, the story of that of the United States Army National Guard soldier. I want to close, uh, ladies and gentlemen, by giving an update on some upcoming events. Uh, I'll mention a few, but as always, uh, you can see all of our future events uh, by visiting AUSA.org. Up next, for December, AUSA thought leaders with Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, U.S. Army retired, the author of Battleground the fight for defend the free world. On 9 December, our good friend, Sergeant Major uh, Andrew Lombardo, the United States Army Reserve Command Sergeant Major, here to give us an update on an annual report on the efforts of the United States Army Reserve soldiers for 2020. And on 10 December, AUSA thought leaders, the Medal of Honor Graphic Novel Roundtable. So ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't seen the Medal of Honor Graphic um, graphic novels, I'd invite you to look at our website. All eight of them are published there and they're a phenomenal series. And finally, uh, announced this week, um, please mark your calendars, ladies and gentlemen, for the Global Force Next, 16 to 18 March, 2021. Be on the lookout for information on how to register and information in the near future on Global Force. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining us today. And Sergeant Major Sampa, thank you again for joining us here at the Noon Report. My pleasure being here. And uh, I'm so proud to say that uh, I'm the Army Guard Command Sergeant Major serving uh, our great states and the United States of America. Thank you again. Thank you.